It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Phil McRae. He's a curious ranch boy from Twin Butte, Alberta. And for those of you that don't know, it is in the Pincher Creek Waterton area. So right away in my books, he's a good, awesome, wholesome guy because I'm from Southern Alberta as well. And uh, he's a self-proclaimed explorer. He loves exploring ideas, continents, people, and he is forever seeking out what's over the horizon. His lovely wife Elaine is with us today, and their children Morgan and Duncan have joined them here in the mountains for the weekend. As we visited this morning, I tried to kind of bottom line, okay, who is this dynamic, intelligent ranch dude? Well, he tells me he's a teacher, and teachers are continual learners. And Phil loves to imagine, reimagine, create, recreate, and live his preferred future. In that short time, I've come away inspired. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Phil McRae with us this morning. And just a heads up, the session comes with a bit of a warning. Phil is going to rock our socks. Please welcome Dr. Phil. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. And thank you for the introduction. Curious Ranch Boy. I don't know if I, if I should, uh, how I should take it, but I am a, a ranch kid from Southern Alberta. So being in the mountains for me is a gift, right? Um, I live in Edmonton now. So the closer I can get to home, um, the greater it is. And especially when I'm here with our family. So what I'm going to do in the next 42 minutes and 10 seconds is I'm going to take you on a journey. And that journey is really a conversation about the changes that are afoot for our children and youth, and what we might want to do in terms of reshaping the future. And I love the title of this conference, Shape the Future, because I think we're at a point where there are probable futures. And I'm gonna give you some of them. I'm gonna talk about the Internet of Things and Google Glass and technology and where it is going. But I also think that we have an obligation to really believe that we can affect change. If any of you know of Alice Walker, she wrote The Color Purple. She said the greatest barrier to power is when people don't believe they have any. And I have a huge belief that we can affect change. And one of the things I'm going to do in this presentation is give you some research, some uh, really solid grounded what's going on, where are we going, and then talk about some of the imperatives. Before I do that though, um, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. So I want to thank the Everactive Schools team and Brian for the invitation because I, uh, I think we should give them a big hand. This is an awesome. <clears throat> I mean, last night, you guys rocked the dance floor. Um, but when I look at this group, you are a diverse, really well-educated, connected population. And when you take a look at crowds, that's, that is a, a wise crowd. When you have a diverse population of teachers and health professionals and educators from different sectors, all with a great deal of knowledge in their area, I look at this as a massive resource in terms of where we can go in the province in the future. So this presentation is called Achieving a Fine Balance in a Digitally Saturated World, because increasingly I feel like that. I'm just going to ask you a question. How many of you have a phone that has a camera and email in it. Put your hands up and keep it up high. Okay, keep it up high. Look around for a second. How many of you had that phone six years ago? Just like that. If you take a look at how change has affected all of us, it's pretty profound, right? This is the Swiss Army knife of our times. And increasingly, we live in this world where we are connected at any time, at any place, wherever we are, in the mountains, not in the mountains, on the ski hills, not on the ski hills. And we have to start thinking about how do we achieve a balance in a world where technology is ever-present, where it's ubiquitous. Before I do this keynote, though, I want you to think of a quote that's on the bottom there by Marshall McLuhan. Do you guys, have you ever heard the medium is the message? That's Marshall McLuhan. And Marshall McLuhan uh, was born in Edmonton, great Canadian media, media scholar, and he said, we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us. And that's what's starting to happen with our kids, with ourselves. We have so much technology around us that it's actually shaping our identities and our relationships and the way that we 
that we're together, the way that we're present or not present with each other. So I want you to keep that in mind. He actually ripped it off from Churchill. Churchill said we build our buildings and thereafter they build us. Well, Marshall McLuhan was right with technology. We shape our tools and thereafter they shape us, both psychologically and physiologically. So Joyce said I'm a ranch kid, and that's true. This is me. Um, I grew up outside of Waterton, and that's our dog, Sash. It looks like I was raised by wolves. Um, but the reason I want to show you this picture is I'm an explorer, right? I, my work right now, I'm an executive staff officer with the Alberta Teachers Association. I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Alberta. I was faculty at the University of Alberta working out of the dean's office. Um, how many people in here were my grad students that I've taught before? I know that I saw three or four. Okay, let's give them a hand for surviving me. Um, I spent five years as a professor. I was an advisor to the Minister of Education for a couple of years. I taught with the Kainai people on the Blackfoot uh, Reserve for four years, lived in the Middle East, lived in Europe, lived in Asia. And so my life has been really about exploring new ideas and things in the profession of, of teaching, whether it's K-12 or, or post-secondary. And so what this presentation reflects is a lot of my curiosity. And it is true, I am a curious ranch kid from Pincher Creek. But I think that most importantly, we need to be prepared with what's on the horizon and how will we create our preferred future. Because there is a probable future for all of us and for kids, whether it's health and, and uh, physical activity and things are changing. But we also have to start to think about what's a preferred future. So you don't have to madly scramble. That's the website where you can find all of the links and citations and things I talk about today, just philmccray.com. And if you're part of the Twitter elite, um, I don't even know, I have this love-hate thing with Twitter, so I don't want to talk about it. But you can follow me at philmccray, and if you want to send messages, you can there too. It's just another medium of conversation. All right, I'm going to talk about four things. The context, it's really important that you understand how society is changing. Secondly, strong forces. I'm going to specifically look at children, their families, and technology in society. I'll look at a probable future called the Internet of Things, where we're going, and then at the very end, I'm going to give you what I think is our moral imperative. How are we going to work towards a preferred future for our children and youth? How are we going to reshape the future? Because it is changing, and it's changing dramatically. And a lot of times, people feel like it's out of their control, right? Remember what I said at the beginning? The greatest barrier to power is believing you don't have any power. Well, we have the power to affect change, and how might we do that? I'll give some suggestions. 39 minutes and 10 seconds. That sound good? Yeah. All right. So, my caveat, this is going to be drinking from a fire hose. I know it's in the morning. I hope you've had coffee. I know that it was a late night of dancing, but I'm going to give you a smorgasbord of things, and I hope you pick up in your different areas elements of what I share with you this morning. So context. I was 70 kilometers from here two years ago with a group of 43 different representatives from around the world. So it was secretaries of state, heads of education system. It was a whole broad range that the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development brought together to talk about innovative education systems. And I thought, okay, so this is very interesting. What does this look like to this group from around the world from 43 countries? Well, over three days, I heard the following three things ad nauseum. It just didn't stop. We need more choice, we need greater personalization, and increased flexibility. And I thought, okay, that's really interesting, right? What does that look like? Does that mean curriculum choice? Does it mean choice of activities? Does it mean personalization, as in what I want, when I want, individualization? Or does it mean relationships? Does flexibility mean curriculum pathways, that when you get to high school, you can work online or offline or not? I mean, what does it look like? Well, when I asked the group, it was like ostriches in sand, right? What does choice, personalization, flexibility look like? We've been hearing this, and everybody's heads went under the tables, and it was very ambiguous. So. I grabbed a camera and I thought, I need to figure this out. This is clearly in the spirit of the times. This is what's going on. So what is going on in terms of the context of our society? Well, look at Alberta. Even little old Pincher Creek has a Walmart, right? At any point in time, 24 hours a day, 365 days a week, there's 100,000 items in stock. Our young people and ourselves walk into classrooms with more choice than we've ever had. I can get 14 types of oranges, 16 types of yogurt. Right? It's an unbelievable amount of choice that's presented to us 
just in terms of some of our food choices. My father, who turns 85 this year, if he had an orange at Christmas, that was a big deal, right? Well, now look at what it means for us and for our children coming in. They have incredible choice. This is the average food supply of a North American family for one week. Now, I know some of you, your eye is twitching right now. When you take a look at the nutritional content, it freaks me out a little bit as well. But when you look at that, that's a lot of choice. It's a lot of food choice in a week. Whether it's nutritious or not, I don't know. What we know is not everyone has choice, right? In Alberta in particular, we have a paradox of plenty. When I worked in Dubai for four years, I worked for Sheikh Saeed bin Maktoum al Maktoum. He was a sheikh, a king. And he called me the blue-eyed Arab. And the reason he called me that is that we have the largest free energy resource in the, or the largest energy resource in the free world. So we are an incredibly wealthy place in the world. We're actually considered at any given time the 10th wealthiest place. Yet, almost 80,000 kids live in poverty. Huge blight on our society. When you think of what we have as a society with this great wealth, that we have one in 10 kids living in poverty, one in eight in Calgary, one in six in Edmonton. So sure, we have choice, but not everybody has choice. Right? And I see that every day when I'm uh, visiting schools and traveling around. So I'm thinking, okay, where did this evolve from? You know, where's this going? Baskin and Robbins, 1951, 31 flavors of ice cream. That was their marketing mantra. Okay, this is like an auction. I want you to guess in 2013, well, 2014, how many flavors of ice cream can you get from Baskin and Robbins? Okay, this is like an auction. 50. 300. 62. She's right. That's right. There's over a thousand different choices of ice cream. You can get a caramel, cherry, jalapeno, whatever, sent to your house. I, you know, I'm thinking diabetic coma. But this is the world we live in of incredible choice. I'm walking through the West Edmonton Mall. Again, now it's like the beautiful mind. I'm seeing patterns everywhere. Choice, personalization, flexibility. There's this sign from Oakley. Customize your own pair today. Customize, personalize, identify. I can pick right there with a little phone app, the lens, the color, a monograph inside of the phone, the case, have a picture on it and have it sent wherever I want in the world. Just like that. Have it personalized just exactly like I want. Well, I went up to Fort McMurray. Who's from Fort McMurray here? All right, let's give them a huge hand. So some of you, when you're in Fort McMurray, I went and did a keynote with a thousand teachers or something like that, about a thousand. So the night before I was there, and I put this slide on uh, right, a right after I'd been there, I'd stayed in the Radisson. So anybody from the Delta, close your ears, but I stayed in the Radisson, Fort McMurray. And I walked up to the bed and I found this on my bed. It says, have a great night, find your personal sleep number. Right? So I spent 45 minutes looking under pillows, <laughs> in the drawers, under the table, where is my personal sleep number? You know, and of course, being a man, I never read the back of the uh, card. It says, okay, you know, go grab this uh, wand, and it goes from zero to 99, and it changes the bed's pressure, right? So zero is like you're in a cushion, and then 99, it's rock solid or something like that. So I wasted another three hours of my life trying to figure out what my personal sleep number was, my personal sleep number, and honestly, I had the worst sleep of my life. <laughs> Many of us in our homes, we have these personal video recorders, digital video recorders, 80 hours of flexible viewing, anytime, any place, pause live TV, greatest invention ever, right? Kids walk in. They can now have, including ourselves, our television spread across devices, whether it's our handheld, our tablets, our television, our game consoles, our laptops, or, you know, big screens. Now we have any time, any place, or any place media distributed. I see this at McDonald's now. Choice, personalization, and flexibility. Drive up to McDonald's and you see a sign. Any lane, any time. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> But, you know, here again is the zeitgeist, the spirit of our times. Any airline, any flight, any time. I could put a thousand slides up that say the same thing. Well, the context is we now live in a time when our policies are being influenced by the customization that exists in our society. 
Personalized learning, business plan from education, 2010 to 2013. Students need to be engaged in multiple ways to create new learning possibilities that are available, ready for it, anywhere, anytime, any place, at any pace. And still, we are in this really ambiguous space. What does it look like? You know, is it online, offline? Is it deeper? Is it not? What are we really talking about when we hear this? But this is important because it affects everything. It affects all of us. It affects our kids and it affects our own beliefs. Here's a question, okay? I want you to think on this for 30 seconds. Have you, in the last month, had an experience where something was highly or hyper-personalized just for you? So whether it was at a hotel or on your television or online, have you had something where it was customized just for you? Okay, put your hand up if you have. Okay, this is where we're going, is how do we personalize education? How do we personalize more things that are changing? But what does that look like? Well, individuality increasingly is kind of becoming the new conformity, right? I mean, Craig Kielberger and group, they talk a lot about from me to we. I think that's important. I think we're going to have to start thinking about that because increasingly, anywhere, anytime, any place is what I want, when I want, how I want it. That's the context increasingly that we're seeing in our society. When I hear choice, personalized, and flexibility, if I were to go back in time two years, 70 kilometers from here in Banff, I would have said, when we talk about choice, and everybody needs choice, we better start thinking about equity. Because you can't just have choice without equity. And when you think about personalization, if you're talking about the individual, we better think about the community, because these are spectrums. And when we think about flexibility, whether it's curricular or not, we also have to think about responsibility, right? And how do we have responsibility? So this is really, these are the forces, these are the contexts that we live in. And this drives a lot of what's happening. Now, what are the forces that are really impacting what's going on? The kids, the technologies, the parents. So I'm going to focus now, in the next few minutes, on the technologies themselves. And here's where I want to give you some very grounded information. I'm actually going to share with you the first public sharing of the largest study on children and youth online habits. Three days ago it was embargoed. I was on the research team, Media Smarts put it out in Ottawa. It's made national news in the last 48 hours, and I'm going to give you guys some nuggets of information that are very interesting in terms of the largest research study on children and youth and what their online habits are. So, what's going on with technology? It seems like I buy a laptop and it's obsolete by the time I get it home, right? We're on iPhone what? Five, six, seven, eight? You know, we have technology changing fast. Well, there's a very fundamental theory behind that. It's called Moore's Law. Robert Moore, who is the founder of Intel, came up with a law called Moore's Law, which says every 18 months, computing power and capacity doubles. Right? We know this to be true. So this is what it looks like. In my lifetime, 1967, this was the computer of the day. It had a processing speed of 0.25 MIPS and a memory of 144 bytes. If you sent a text or a tweet in the last five minutes, you blew that out of the water. <laughs> the cost was $14 million and it would have filled up half this room. Every 18 months, power capacity doubles. So what do we see in 2014? I can buy a notebook that's eight gigahertz with a terabyte of memory for 479 bucks, right? This is not going away. We're gonna push out to probably 2050 with this kind of change because until they can no longer print on silicone chips, this is the nature of technological change. And when I say it's exponential, this is what exponential means, okay? Close your eyes. I want you to think about the future 100 years from now, right? Whether you imagine flying cars or anything else, close your eyes and imagine what the future looks like 100 years from now. What will this building look like? What will, what will your home look like? What will the technologies look like, okay? Open your eyes, crush that down to 20 years. That's when it will happen. So when I said to you, how many of you had cell phones? The whole, pretty much the group put up their hands, 80%. Well, in six years, six years ago, we didn't have it, right? 
If I were to tell my grandmother who's, who's passed away that one day I would have this, you know, wafer-thin device that could access trillions of different sources of information or we could talk across distance or I could take a picture of a book and it would tell me what the book, where I could buy the book and how much it was and how much it was online, you wouldn't even know how to imagine it. Well, that's where we're going. So if you take a look, this is the world's supercomputer in 2013. It's called Titan. Processing speed of 20 quadrillion calculations per second. That's like 18,000 laptops simultaneously every second processing speed. A memory of 710 terabytes, and it's about $100 million. Well, it's as smart as a dragonfly. That's it. That's its, that's its capacity. And that's pretty smart, actually, when you think of co uh, computing power and capacity. You push out to 2059, who knows, right? It's going to appear... Um, as if technology was magical, right? It will just be very difficult to understand what this looks like in our world going forward. By the way, do you know what Titan's used for? Take a guess. What do you think? John? Military is my first guess too, right? But it's actually climate change modeling because they're worried about what's happening with climate change and so they're using Titan to model the kind of unpredictable patterns of climate change, trying to predict them. Transistor prices dropping rapidly, right? This is what we have. Soon, we're going to have a problem with throwaway technologies, literally. Mark my words that kids will buy a phone in the morning and throw it away in the evening. We have now technology that's becoming pennies. So we're going to have an environmental sustainability issue with technology. How many of you who have those smartphones, put them up, hand up again. Okay, I want, I'm just curious. Keep your hands up. How many of you have the previous version of a BlackBerry or a phone somewhere sitting around your house? <laughs> right, okay. So now we have all of this technology that's changing every 18 months, doubling in power and capacity, and we're getting this kind of resource. So I would suggest that's something we need to start thinking about. So what about parents or guardians? Well, you know, uh, my wife and I, we have a nine and a five-year-old, right? So we're parents. Well, parents are different. Parents are very different. This is a book written by Sherry Turkle, an MIT professor, Rockefeller professor at MIT. I would encourage you to read it. It's called Alone Together, Why We Expect More From Technology and Less From Each Other. She said something in this book that was profound and really caught my attention. From the moment this generation met technology, it was the competition. In many ways, children see technology as a main competitor for their parents' attention. Think about that. I often hear about the digital natives, the idea that young people are, you know, look at how great they are with technology. Well, guess what? Where do they learn it? Take a look at a playground and how many people are looking at their phones, how many parents are on the periphery. One of the things that I'm hearing increasingly from early childhood educators is when they have meet the parent night, they have a good quarter of the parents at the back of the room on their phones, right? Like it's really interesting dynamics that are shifting. What about children's playtime? Since the late 1970s, children have lost 12 hours a week of free time, including a 50% drop in outdoor free play. That is a profound statistic, right? 12 hours a week, loss of free time, and a cut in half of the amount of time that they're outside, right? That has huge implications. This is something that came out of the University of Michigan, the Institute for Social Research. And when I saw this first, I thought, well, what's going on? Okay, there's lots of things. It's not one silver bullet answer. Parents are increasingly afraid to let kids go out and play or, you know, walk on their own. Um, kids are more scheduled than they've ever been, right? They're doing all kinds of activities. We see, um, you know, screen time has actually absolutely exploded. All of these things are happening. But the question becomes, what does this mean for us? Two friends of mine, both doctors, um, emergency room doctors call the cell phone the new baby rattle. Because in the emergency wards and in the hospitals, they see this used as a pacifier with kids, right? That really disturbed me. Now for them, they're like, yeah, you know, that gets warm and the bacteria really grows and they were an interest, you know, they're like, this isn't great for health. I'm like, what about the serve and return between parent and child? What about the interactions? That's the concerns I have. This is the iPod for iPad. Right? Oh, yeah. Okay, my admission is I kind of want one, but I don't want to talk about it <laughs> for myself. Um, this is the part we edit out of the video. 
No, the reality is, what are we thinking, right? The iPoddy for iPad, what are we thinking? Well, it gets worse. This is the activity swing. So the idea is that you put an iPad in, baby's locked in, and there's the swing, right? Well, you know what? I've been very publicly talking about, for now four or five years, what do our colleagues, what, are the, what does the profession say about, um, in medicine and in education, about how much screen time, right? I mean, we know some things. We know some things that we shouldn't be thinking about and doing. So what is going on? We shape our technologies and thereafter they shape us. It's a prime example. Brain enhancing videos, do you guys remember those videos? The, uh, the I can't say it probably, but remember the, the videos of you will be brilliant if you watch these videos? Well, for every hour per day that infants watch baby DVDs and videos, they learn six to eight fewer vocabulary words than babies who never watch the videos. What happened is the Federal Trade Commission issued a recall because of false advertising, and if you had a baby Einstein, you could get your money back. This is where we have to start thinking about, is this okay when we know this? No, relationship, relationship, relationship. The serve and return between adult and child is critical. Have you ever seen this? This is an advertisement. It's the real deal, I didn't make it up. For a better start in life, start cola earlier. How soon is too soon? I don't know if you can see this, but I highlighted it for you. Promote active lifestyles. <laughs> Boosts personality. Gives body essential sugars. Right? So, the concern I have is, you know what? I'm not buying what they're selling. No screen time for children under the age of two. That is the Canadian Pediatric Society and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations. None, zero. Not 15 minutes, not 20 minutes, but zero screen time, right? So what is it for those of us over the age of two? Take a guess. Two hours. Two hours a day, right? That's very difficult. I mean, how do we achieve a fine balance in a world where kids are spending seven hours and 38 minutes a day in front of screens? TVs, videos, uh, games, etc. You know, we are really in an interesting time about achieving a fine balance. If there's nothing else you remember from this keynote, I'm gonna ask you to remember these four things. Because if I were to say, what should we remember in terms of moving forward with ever active schools and healthy lifestyles, it comes to me in four things. This is actually healthy neurological brain development, but I would go beyond just brain development. I think this, this works for everything. This is from a colleague and a friend of mine, Dr. Michael Rich from Boston Children's Hospital, a Harvard pediatrician. He says, we need positive human interaction. I think we need this as adults, this isn't just kids. Active connection with the physical environment. 50% drop in outdoor free play, get kids' hands in the mud. What they know is that when you're engaged with the physical environment actively, when you're actually out there, it changes the neurosynaptic development, right? This isn't just it's good for your cardiovascular system, it actually changes the physiological structures of the brain when you're outside. We need to remember that this is a part of our world and how do we actively connect with the physical environment? Free play, lots of overstructuring, right? So his call is how do we open up some of the free play and opportunities for creative problem solving. Pretty good recipe, right? In terms of moving forward, I think. Two years ago, we had a research colloquium on the psychosocial I'll come back to this at the end, if you didn't get all of them. We did a research colloquium on the psychosocial and physiological impacts of technology two years ago. Brian was there. Some of you might have come. It was an invitation research colloquium. We invited Michael from Harvard, pediatrician, the head of the Center for Media and Child Health. And we invited a senior neuroscientist from the University of Bristol, Paul Howard Jones. What I want to do is share with you what they told us, okay? And actually, maybe before I do that, I'm going to give you a caveat. I didn't do it at the beginning. So my PhD is in emerging technologies. I think they have great promise. I love my GPS, my Songza. I think the ability to video conference with kids in other parts of the world to help develop their consciousness and perspective is brilliant. So I'm not just about, you know, get rid of technology. I'm about finding a balance. But this shocked me. 
when I heard from them that these were some of their findings in terms of physiology. Evening use of technology is leading to disrupted sleep. It's called nocturnal use of technology. So when kids sleep with their phones or when they have their phones beside their bed, the melatonin in the brain is decreasing because of the screens, the backlit screens. And that's impacting sleep quality and quantity. Do we have any uh, physicians in the room? Okay, so some of the physicians you probably, uh, you know, when it comes to the uh, comorbidities or some of the other things that are related in terms of um, sleep, well, for the education sector, we see readiness to learn, right? Are kids ready to learn or have they been up all night gaming or, you know, what are the impacts on sleep quality and quantity? How does that affect um, obesity or health, right? Physical health. I mean, there's lots of stuff, but this is something that really grabbed my attention in terms of some, some hard evidence starting to emerge around decrease in melatonin, which is impacting sleep quality and quantity. Excessive screen time, access gaming, television, interferes with psychosocial well-being, anxiety and depression rising, and physiological health, obese, obesity and uh, type 2 diabetes. They said that there's a noted increase in aggressive response from playing violent video games, specifically in boys. The Israeli military now starts to train or pre-select people in terms of how they uh, play video games. Because what they found is video games are so good at reshaping the, some of the neurosynaptic pathways that it, it actually can create now some really aggressive responses. It's not just a habit of mind, it's actually starting to change some of these pathways in the brain. That, that to me is fascinating that neuroscientists are looking at, at these changes and they're rapid. They're not sure what's happening, but they're seeing some of these changes with gaming and they're you know really interested in the implications. And then the attentional and vision problems were the other impacts that they mentioned. Um, again, on the website, filmacray.com, you'll find a link to all of the PowerPoints, all of the videos, and all of the resources from this research colloquium. We're holding another one, an invitational research colloquium, and we're looking forward to having interactive schools there as well, because this is a conversation we need to have together. The website that I would encourage you to look at if you're interested, because Dr. Rich and his team update it consistently, is cmch.tv, the Center on Media and Child Health uh, out of Ch uh, Children's Hospital Boston and Harvard Medical School. And it's great because you know what it does? It has a little printable sheet that you can print out saying at this age group from, you know, four to six, from six to eight and so on. It doesn't say, you know, we understand kids are going to be exposed to media and all media are educational. It's what they teach us that we need to start thinking about. Students. Well, what's going on with our students? The internet just is, right? Get over it. If I walked into this room and I said to you, you guys have light. You have electricity. This is amazing. You'd think, where have I been for the last 100 years, right? Well, it's the same with young people, right? The internet is part and parcel of the fabric of their world. 99% of kids between grades four and 11 have access to the internet outside of school. 99%, right? Like that's ubiquitous. So the internet just is. They have new views on authority, right? Wikipedia. When I was at U of A, the number one source of information for undergrads, <laughs> Wikipedia, right? Freaked out many of my colleagues. They have new views on privacy. Facebook, Instagram. There's a blurring of online and offline realities. What it means to be carbon and what it means to be silicone is blurring. I'm online right now, but I'm offline, right? Like this idea that we used to go online and go offline is blurring. And very soon, as I'll show you in the last part of this presentation, that is changing and it's changing just like that. Unparalleled digital mobility, okay? New data that I'll share with you shortly here on, in terms of that. And they want personalized digital content, anytime, any place, any pace. These are the students, these are the new millennials, these are some of the expectations, these are some of the new realities of what we're facing in terms of technology. Sherry Turkle has said something that I think is really interesting psychologically. She says increasingly youth share, therefore they are. Right? You know that I think, therefore I am? She's turned that around and she says, I share, therefore I am. So you see a lot of people that aren't really present, they're absent in the moment because they're sharing where they are, what they're doing, right? And that's one of the reasons why I'm challenging some of the hyper-connectedness of what's happening. 
because it's this idea that by sharing, they reinforce who they are and their identity, as opposed to actually living or being in the moment. And that's the same with adults. It's not just kids, right? Oftentimes, we are alone together. The biggest North American study of 8 to 18 year olds by the Kaiser Foundation. You've probably heard that stat, and I saw a video yesterday that talked about seven hours and something in front of screens. Well, this is where it comes from. If you want to be informed, read this study, because it is very interesting in terms of what they found. In 1999, young people were spending seven and a half hours in front of screens, so that's TVs, video games, cell phones, etc. 2004 was eight hours and 33 minutes, and then in 2009 it was 10 hours and 45 minutes. I said 10 hours and 45 minutes, I don't buy it, right? What is it? But after I read the report, you see what it is. It's multitasking. So they have seven and a half hours in front of screens, physically present in front of screens. But then they add this thing called multitasking. So they have their laptop here, their phone here, earbud, right? And basically they're multitasking with technologies. TV on in the background, etc. Well, you know what we've learned in the last couple of years? Multitasking is a myth. If somebody tells you, this young generation, they can multitask. They cannot. Clifford Nass out of Stanford has done a study. Even the highest level multitaskers, the people who self-identify as being, I can handle it all. I can tweet and drive, right? You shouldn't do that, I'm just saying. <laughs> but it's a myth. What they have found in terms of the Neiman Foundation report of Harvard University in 2010 is it's called continuous partial attention. I'm kind of, sort of paying attention to these things at the same time, which is actually what it's like to be a parent, but I don't want to talk about that either. <laughs> Trouble filtering relevant from irrelevant information. What's important? The semi coming at me is more important than the text. Managing short-term memory. Well, now we can offshore our memory. We can put stuff in a digital storage bin. We don't really have to think about it, right? So that's starting to happen. And task switching going from one thing to the next. The highest level multitaskers are having the most difficulty. So somebody tells you the young people are great multitaskers and this is just the world, tell them it's a myth and to read Clifford Nass or Dave Crenshaw's book. So here it is. This is the kind of opening of what we found. Mediasmarts.ca is where you can find this data. It's been published in many of the major newspapers. It was on all the television channels. Three days ago, it was embargoed. In the last 48 hours, it's been all over the media. It's the largest Canadian research study of children and teens' online habits. It was funded by the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, the Alberta Teachers Association, and the Canadian Internet Registry Ath Registration Authority. And I sat on the research advisory group for this study. 5,400 kids, grades 4 to 11. Every single province and territory was covered, urban and rural. Here's what they found. 99% of Canadian students have access to the internet outside of school, right? We are now in a place of ubiquitous access for young people to the internet. It just is. Cell phone. This is grade four at the bottom. This is grade 11. The blue line is they own their own cell phone. The green line is they have access to a cell phone. And this is a cell phone that belongs to others. What do you see between grade four and grade 11? is the ownership of cell phones goes up dramatically. This is what it actually looks like. 24% of kids in Canada in grade four have a cell phone or a smartphone. 31% in grade five, 38 in grade six, 52 in grade seven, 68 in grade eight, 83 in grade nine, 87 in grade 10, 85 in grade 11. Right? 39% of youth, children and youth who have cell phones sleep with them. As my wife said, who would ever admit that? <laughs> this, is, this is something we need to think about. Think about it for us, right? How many times is the cell phone beside the bed? Nocturnal screen time. This is very interesting in terms of habits. Do you know why they sleep with their cell phones? They sleep with their cell phones because they don't want to miss a text message or an update, right? Continuous partial attention. Those of you working with 11 to 14 year olds, that's where we see a dramatic jump in media consumption. They have four hours more a day, 11 to 14 year olds, than kids younger than them. There's where you see 
dramatic change. So if you want to talk about a target population in terms of intervention and work, 11 to 14 year olds are where they get more independence and where they start to use media and consume it more and more. 30% of kids in grade four to six have a Facebook account. Do you know what the age is to get a Facebook account? You have to be 13. Hmm. I don't want to talk about it. The paradox is we increasingly also have a generation that's socially connected but isolated. This is a, this is a really interesting phrase, the paradox of socially connected isolation. I have 2,000 friends on Facebook, but guess what? They don't have any friends. So you know what? When I hear people talk about Facebook, I think of it like theater. Everybody's world is perfect on Facebook, right? So think about the dynamic that that sets up for young people. Think about the psychosocial implications of some of that, of being connected, of being isolated, right? Jane Twinge, San Diego State, five times as many high schools and college students are dealing with anxiety and depression and other mental health issues compared to the time of the Great Depression. This is out of a book, Generation Me, and a study she did with 12 million adolescents. Something is going on with our young people when we have that kind of fragility, right? And this is pretty hard data. Many of you see it, right, increasingly. This is Duncan, our son, and my dad. For me, I think about how do we disconnect? How do we achieve a fine balance by being online, because that's our lives, but at the same time, saving stillness? The ability to be present without just being connected 24-7 at any place, any pace, any time. So something that Sherry Turkle talks about, and for adolescents, it's critical for, for their development. How do we save stillness, right? Because she always says, if you don't teach kids to be alone, how will, they will grow up to be lonely, right? Like some really interesting things in there. Media Smarts, grades four to six. One in four students in grades four to six in Canada are never with an adult or parent when they go online at home. Hmm, they're more connected than ever, but they're not with somebody as well, at least a quarter of them. In 2005, when we did the first study, there was a question asked about parental involvement with media. Are there rules about any of these in your house? Getting together with someone you met online. Three quarters of parents had rules for getting together with somebody online. Sites that you're not supposed to visit. 70% of parents had rules. Talking to strangers online or on your cell phone, 69%. This is probably some of the data that rocked my world the most when I saw it come out three days ago. In 2013, 44% of parents have that same rule around getting together with somebody they met online. Sites you're not supposed to visit, 48%. Talking to strangers, 52%. This means that the technology has become so ever-present and available, we're not even thinking about it anymore. We used to talk about keep your computer in your living room. Well, now, we have iPads and phones and computer everywhere, and now it's changing that dynamic. Young people, this is my summary of this study so far, and I'm flying to Ottawa to actually go into the data in, in greater detail, but they're more connected and mobile than ever with fewer rules and less supervision. That's interesting. What can we do? How many of you are interested in the idea of resilience? Okay, I love this book, Resilience, Why Things Bounce Back by Andrew Zoli, it's about a year old. This book talks about the capacity of a system or a person to maintain its core purpose in the face of dramatically changed circumstances. Well, we live in a world that's volatile, ambiguous, complex and uncertain, right? That's the nature of our world. How are we building resilience in your young people in a highly hyper-connected world? Well, in this book, they talk about some key things. Physical health is important for resilience. You have to have quality social networks. Maybe they are online. Maybe they are quality online social networks, but they have to be meaningful. Access to social resources, education, public health. These are things that build a resilient society. Quality of personal relationships. The belief that I can have agency over my actions, that the world won't just be like a tsunami over top of me, that I can affect change. Optimism and positive outlook towards change exposure to diverse ideas and experiences, and the ability to embrace ambiguity. This is what he says is needed for real resilience. When you take a look at those, makes sense, right? 
But we have to start thinking with a more fragile, anxious and depressed population about how we can work through active schools to build resilience. That's really a big part of our moral imperative together. Four minutes and 10 seconds. Uh, I've been saying in all conference, take your time. <laughs> <laughs> so where are we going? Well, it's called the Internet of Things. Right now, there are more things connected to the Internet than there are people on the planet. More fridges, more cars, more phones than people on the planet. This is the LG fridge. You guys ever seen this? So this is what it does. I buy some milk, and milk has a little RFID chip in the bottom of it, right? Radio frequency identifier. And in that milk, I put it in my fridge, and of course, I'm driving home from work one day, and on my phone it goes, beep, Phil, this is your fridge. Your milk's expired, and I can tell because of where your phone is that you're close to a grocery store. You need to pull in and get some new milk, right? And I say, thank you, fridge. <laughs> so we're in a time of pervasive information awareness. It's not just fridges. It's washers and dryers, it's robotic robots, etc. When I was in Dubai, um, I was in academic English. I'd, I'd been hired from the Blood Reserve where I taught social studies and English in uh, the adult upgrading program at Red Crow College to be an academic English instructor, working with submarine commander, physicist from Baghdad, a mechatronics engineer from Victoria. And when I was there, my students in 2004 were using the internet to open and close doors and lock houses and so on. 2004. That's when I did my master's degree and then further went on to do a PhD because I saw the world was changing dramatically, right? Well, where are we going to go with this? Think of smart clothing. Um, I was in New York in 2006 and I actually had a chance to see when I was doing a, a research presentation actual smart clothing. And what it has is sensors embedded into it. So on the far left side there, this is the military's sheet of, uh, you know, undergarment. And if a bullet were to go through that, it would release coagulant into the bloodstream and the sensors would send the heart rate, the blood pressure, et cetera, back to the medic team coming into the scene, right? And this was now, you know, almost a decade ago that they were doing this. What we're starting to see in terms of consumer access is the mood jacket. This is from Scandinavia. You throw the jacket over top of your head, it reads your infrared signature, and then it plays music based on your mood into your ears. Right? So if you need to be pumped up or calmed down, it knows what kind of music you like, and it reads your infrared signature. Um, again, why I talk about the promise and peril of technology, we see some really brilliant, amazing things happening. Sudden infant death syndrome. They're looking at how they can put babies in cocoons at night. And then that will measure and give you know, alerts if, if things are going on that shouldn't happen. So you know, it's not just about, there's some really interesting things. Down here is an actual sensor in terms of the Internet of Things where you have an athlete. And it measures not after the race, but in the nanosecond what the oxygenation content is. Um, you know, it, it's doing real-time data gathering at every nanosecond. Do you see this picture right here? Hey, right, what is it? Some of you who maybe seen a presentation can't, can't say anything. What do you think it is? Take a guess. Looks like a power pack. It is playground armor. Yeah. So, you know, when the parent is there and they're texting and the kid falls off the swing, it sends them a text. It says the kid fell off the swing. So, coming soon, we become sensors. Nokia patented the vibrating haptic tattoo. This is an existing patent. This is the images from the patent itself. And what happens is you don't pull your phone out and answer it, but you have a little tattoo that has sensors in it. When your phone rings, your tattoo vibrates and you just touch it and you can answer your phone, right? So this is now, not just theoretically there, but they've started to patent the technology because they want to move forward with it. So guess what? We become the sensors. We are becoming the quantified self. This is something you may have heard about if you haven't. Very interesting for your area and your field of work. Humans are now more mobile with technologies. They're more social. So what are they doing? This is a real screenshot from the web. There are people who have little devices or phones. You can do it from anything. And you upload your weight on a daily basis. 
Yeah, and some of you are like, what? <laughs> what? So what's happening is these large communities are starting to share, right? They're sharing their data. They're sharing their health habits. They're putting it up. They're becoming more social than ever. They are measuring, literally weighing and measuring themselves, and they're throwing it up, right? If you have, if you have uh, Nike sensors in your shoes, right? It tells you where you're running, transactional cartography, or you know, all kinds of different things. This is the world we're moving into, the Internet of Things. So when I was in New York at this conference, looking at this clothing, right? First thing I thought after I saw it is, one day an ambulance is gonna pull up, and it's gonna be like, get in, because you're having a heart attack, and I don't even know it, because the, you know, <laughs> knock on wood, knock on wood. But it was very interesting. I had a big Blackberry 2006, walked into a ballroom like this, 500 people. They had us do this thing on a little app. They didn't really have apps at that time, but it was this profile where you had to say your interests, your passion, your gender, your age, etc. And you walked into a room just like this, just like last night's uh, shake-up, right, party. And when you get near somebody, because you guys were a rowdy crowd, when you get near somebody, your phone, somebody who has similar passions and interests, your phone vibrates, right? And my wife was totally not impressed, right? <laughs> so, have you heard of Google Glass? Well, this is where we're going. Google Glass has an internet sensor in it. It records the life stream, they call it. People put it on right now, it exists. I don't know how many different units there are, but basically wherever you are, it's recording what's going on and it's picking up. And then that little screen there, right? It, it acts as a lens, like a computer lens. And your, your retina goes up to a corner and it pops up. Sounds like science fiction, but it's real, right? Google the uh, Google Glass and you'll find the video. Well, it's starting to be used for operations, it's being used in health and fitness. There's a swimmer with Google Glass built into his goggles. And now people are talking about literally recording an entire life from beginning to end, right? 40 terabytes of data will be available in 2015. Personally, by 2025, 40 exabytes, which means you can record an entire life. This has huge implications for us. It's going to mean increasingly the technology is present but absent. People will have it in their glasses because they're already making contracts to have it embedded in the glass, right, a regular designer glasses, or in contacts. And think about being at your favorite restaurant and somebody in the back has Google Glass on. Like, I don't know what this means for privacy, but I'm a little bit concerned. I think I'm more concerned that I will never, ever win another argument with my wife. <laughs> because it'll be recorded and, quite frankly, I'm never right. But. It's true. So privacy in public spaces is going to be an issue for us. I'm going to show you this video and then I'm going to go to close, okay? This is just a kind of a fun video. You can find it online, Louis C.K., and it just shows us how dramatically technology has changed, that literally we've become blind to progress. So in closing, what I think is really important is that we don't forget that we have agency, that we have the ability to not just see the probable future that's unfolding in front of us with the Internet of Things, but we have a preferred future. And honestly, this is an inspiring conference. This is a great place, not only because I can see how you come together as a community, but because you really are people who are affecting change for young people, our children and others, every single day. So here's what I would say from Dr. Phil in terms of imperatives. <laughs> we need to achieve a fine balance, right? Positive human interaction, active connection with the physical environment, free play, and opportunities for creative problem solving. Technology is not going away. It is going to get more powerful. It is going to get more ubiquitous. How do we balance out? Resiliency. Let's get into this in a big way. Let's talk about it. What do we know about resiliency? What don't we know? What do we know about self-efficacy, collective and individual efficacy? These are things that we need to be thinking about as professionals. What is it that we can do to build stronger communities, stronger families, stronger schools, right, for children and youth? I think we need to start establishing boundaries in a boundless era. So at our house, the phones don't come to the dinner table. In terms of sending emails, we make it a cultural thing where you don't send emails at 9, 10, and 11 at night, and then everybody spins out and is sending emails. How do you build boundaries 
in a world of any time, any place, any pace, right? It seems antithetical to talk about building boundaries in a world that's opening up, but I would say for sustainability, we need to start thinking about boundaries so that we can have strong personal relationships. Saving stillness, right? I love this picture because to me, how are we able to disconnect at certain periods of time in a world where we're on 24 seven? And you know what? The final thing is be conscious of the distractions. There are so many distractions, right? There's so many great things that we can do with technologies, but we have to be conscious of some of these distractions. And we have to be conscious of lots of different things. The thing that I would say is not a distraction is this. There's Morgan and there's Duncan. And when I look at this, I think the work that we do in all of our sectors, but especially in education where I live, this is a moral imperative to keep kids healthy and active. This isn't just a good idea or a curriculum objective. This is a moral imperative for the sustainability of our society and for us to flourish from one generation to the next. So with that, I want to thank all of you for your dedication to this work um, and tell you that I am absolutely honored to be here and I hope you enjoyed the morning. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, what up? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, everything after Baskin Robbins, I was <laughs> absolute sprint. Um, stand up if you will change your life after that. Be honest. Phil, Phil's confident man. He can take it. Stand up if you will change your life after hearing that information. Uh, knowledge, knowledge is a gift, and today we got a gift. So, Dr. McRae, um, I also got a note that it's your birthday. So, um, Dr. McRae, thank you for that gift of knowledge, and my life will change. Thank you. <laughs>